Hello, and welcome to Book Reviews Kill, a podcast about fantasy, sci-fi, and horror novels. I'm Chad. And I'm Evan. And you're joining us today for our recap and discussion of Malice, book one in the Faithful and the Fallen series by John Gwynn. Wow, that was quite the book. That was Oof. that was a big, long, epic fantasy book that I was not really mentally prepared for. <laughs> no, I finished this multiple days ago, and I'm still like all a, a tumble inside of yeah. my head which is like names and places and events and a great story but man is there a lot happening here it was a lot going on here it was more than i was prepared for uh going Same. in i thought uh, yeah at first i was like okay corbin okay evness okay oh 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 my god oh what stop stop oh my god stop, <laughs> stop, so stop. many uh, names ventos camlin there <laughs> toll maquin rafe pharrell ah did you get kind of like Canius vibes? Uh, no, no. I mean, I got the, only in the sense that a lot of the names were similar, like yeah. Brenna and Brennan and Corbin and Camlin. And they have like nicknames for each other too, like Ban or Cam or, you know what I mean? So that was uh-huh. getting, and also uh, Gwyn seems to really like uh, introducing, like if someone walks into a room, Corbin's like, oh, it's that guy. And then that guy's brother and that guy's brother's dog. And it's like, did we yeah. really need the guy's brother and the guy's brother's dog if they're not going to say anything, John? Like, come on. <laughs> Hector, Evans. There's a lot of similar names here, which is really confusing. But I get why there's so many names. I mean, this is a total like filled out world. A lot of people, and everybody has a name, so they have nobody names. can like, accuse not... Mr. Gwyn of not filling his world out. No, that not at for all. Sure. Um, I really like this. Yeah, I mean, I we're, we're ribbing it a little bit right now, but I mean, the first half of it, I was definitely a little bit like, ah, oh, geez, what did we get ourselves into? This is this Same. is a lot. Like, I don't know, but I've read a ton of epic fantasy, and so, and I know that you have too. So, I mean, I know. I knew doing this, I would need to kind of just sit and like trudge through the first couple hundred pages. And then once I got around the middle, I just flew through it. I mean, the end of this book is excellent. It's awesome. I was very immersed. I was very engaged with what was going on. As soon as I kind of knew what characters I really needed to pay attention to and what were kind of the more peripheral or like tertiary characters that were important to the story, but just like not as important as corbin and cohen right and, you know what i mean like veratus is obviously so it's like I, when i turned the page and it was a veratus chapter i knew some ding, really ding, key ding, stuff attention. was going on here it's funny how expectations and setting them properly within our brain can affect our experience of a book right because as soon as i kind of i kind of had the same experience with a little bit of confusion but then as soon as i realized what i was in for and what i was reading my brain like like, kicked on into like complicated fantasy novel mode and then i was just like okay now i got it and i just was there for it so if you have not read these books yet know what you're in for and put on your complex fantasy pants because you're gonna need them here and maybe not even so much as story just the amount of characters i would yeah, say Yeah, i mean the story was pretty straightforward. pretty straightforward i liked the story a lot i was that was the thing i, I think i was the most engaged in was like the, the potential that this story has to get really epic and that was the thing that was really keeping me going through kind of being a little confused and putting place names and character names and the the like the lore you know if there's a huge lore dump at the beginning of this yeah, book huge and, lore dump <laughs> and i was just like whoo wow Whoa. that is a whole lot of things that i didn't know about before mr gwen like yeah, hopefully these uh, come the up things again that got me were like the subtleties like there's one part where and we'll get into this with a recap that we'll do here quickly but there's one part where there's like a character who gets captured and he tells that like one of your kings is going to betray you and then it turns out that it was not the king it was so that king that person set it up so that the nether the prince would go like meet him and it was like those sort of subtleties i was like wait what is happening right here and it took me a few like read throughs to be like oh oh it was a trick okay you tricked me it was so tricky you know yeah um i think that this series has a a great sense of immersion you know like i really liked that the landscape was a lot different than a lot of other epic high fantasy that i've read in what way i mean you know just like we've got giants and dregs and it's really like cold and snowy and it's got like this kind of nordic like iron age feel to it that a lot of more like traditional western european uh, medieval fantasy just this is a, a new territory for me especially with like epic high fantasy i mean like i've read nordic inspired stuff but nothing of this i think it's like celtic maybe because at first i thought viking but then i was like no i think these are celts because i looked up some of the names and some of the like 
origins of oh, them are did? Celtic yeah. in nature. Yeah. Um, I think maybe Gwyn was just, I mean, maybe uh, we could have him on for an interview and ask him, but I think maybe Gwyn um, was probably inspired by a lot of uh, different cultures around a, a certain time period, maybe. And then he kind of like borrowed from some of them and made his own. Yeah. You know, there like, was some Roman throw outs in there too. Yeah. Like this doesn't feel like a one to one Nord to no. fantasy thing like it, it feels like very much his own thing which is one of the reasons i was so enamored with this book once i kind of got over the hurdle of all the names the set and setting was so great this idea that there's this god war about to happen with this kind of fallen god and it, just the fact that you know typically in fantasy books i'm not like a huge fan of pantheons and stuff like that like or prophecies it depends on what it is like if it's if it's a thing where it's like oh the the gods are only as effective as how much we believe in them like i'm so sick of that trope like i really yeah. don't want to read it anymore but but this idea where you've got kind of like this fallen god and then this other kind of better good i don't know but maybe good god, bad god i don't know if it's I, I, i'm hoping that as the series goes on it'll be more complicated than that you know, like Azroth is not just like, blah, 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 I want to destroy the world. But I mean, if that's what it is, that's what it is. I mean, I think the complication might come from the bad gods agents perhaps are pretending to be the good gods agents. Or think you know? that they are. Or think that's, that they that's are, the yeah. Thing. That's what one of the other things that I really enjoyed about this was like, it felt a little bit like I was kind of on to Nathair the entire time. <laughs> yeah, you know, me uh, too. But Nathair is way a really... too quick to be like, I am the light bringer, the soul <laughs> I know, crusher, it's like the first about book. me yeah. being awesome. Me, me, me. Um, let's go Let's go right into the recap and then we can discuss much further and in, in much more detail. Let's do it. The book begins in the Banished Lands, 20 years before the main events in Malice. In a prologue from Evnis's perspective, Evnis pledges himself to the god Asroth in exchange for a promise of immense power and forms an alliance with Rin, Queen of Cambron. Viratus ben Lamar is the second son of Lamar, Baron of Ripa, and brother to Krellis and Ector. Viratus's story begins with him accompanying his older brother Krellis to Gerilin, where they take a Vin Thalon prisoner, Dinan, to see King Aquilus. The prisoner trades information for his life and tells Aquilus that the Vin Thalon king, Lycos, is meeting in secret with one of Aquilus's barons. Needing to know if a conspiracy is afoot, Aquilus sends his son Nathair with Viratus and a small group of men to find out which baron has betrayed the king and discover what he may about their plans. They find out the rumor has been contrived so a Vin Thalon named Calidus can meet with Prince Nathair. Calidus then introduces Nathair to a giant friend of his called Alcyon. Calidus tells Nathair the Vin Thalon wished to sign a treaty with Tenebril and reveals he has united the many seafaring clans of the Vin Thalon in preparation for a a coming evil. King Aquilus has suffered raids along his coastal towns from Vin Thalon fleets for far too long, and Calidus knows he will never be able to earn the High King's trust. We learn later that Calidus privately told Nathair he believes him to be the Bright Star, also called the Seren Disclair, who is spoken of in an ancient giant prophecy, naming him the earthly champion of a goodly god and the only man capable of defeating the evil god Azroth's champion, known as the Black Sun. Seeing the giant, and thinking Nathair to be in need of protection, Varadis jumps through a wall of flames to save him. While Nathair was never in harm's way, Varadis' act of bravery, sacrifice, and loyalty has a great effect on Nathair, who eventually makes a blood oath with Varadis and names him as his first sword. Knowing his father would oppose his actions, Nathair agrees to a treaty with the Vin Thalon, thoroughly convinced by Calidus, who pledges himself and his forces to Nathair. Viratus and Nathair attend a council of kings King Aquilus has called. Aquilus is High King of the Banished Lands, though the position of High King seems more ceremonial than a position of actual rule. The other kings heed his call to meet and are free to disagree and choose the path they think best for their people and country. During the council, King Aquilus warns all of an ancient prophecy. There shall rise a bright star for the side of good of the god Elion, and there shall rise a black son of evil for the villainous deity Azroth. 
Aquilus wants everyone to join with him, and convinces some to ally with him. He is disappointed more kings don't promise to work together when this dark time comes. The somewhat underwhelming response at the king's council convinces his son Nathair that joining the banished lands into a single empire, led by a single leader, is the only way to defeat the coming evil. Shortly after the council, Nathair and Varadis witness a gigantic column of ants devour a dog and swarm over a small child. With help from Castel and Maquin, Varadis manages to save the child. Varadis, Castel, and Maquin become friends. After witnessing the tiny ants working together to overcome the much bigger dog, Nathair developed the concept of a shield wall as a way to defeat the giants threatening their borders. Nathair is sent by his father Aquilus to Tarbesh to deal with the giant incursions. With Varadis in tow and his shield wall trained warriors, he defeats the giants. Nathair's army is hard pressed as they are rushed by not only giants, but giants riding giant lizards known as dregs. Nathair admires the intimidating lizard mounts and lets his desire to have one be known. Calidus' giant friend Alcyon says he will get one for him. Though instructed to have no further dealings with the untrustworthy Vin Thalen, Nathair ignores his father's command and uses Vin Thalen's ships to move his troops, angering his father. Nathair is now thoroughly convinced he is the Bright Star, as he has been seeing strange premonitions in his dreams. Calidus then persuades Nathair to seek out the Jahar, a group of warriors living in a secret city known as Telassar. The Jahar believe in the prophecy, and have been training for generations, waiting for the Saren Disclayer to be revealed. Calidus knows the way to the hidden city and leads Nathair and Varadis there. While the Jahar are initially skeptical that Nathair is the Bright Star, or Saren Disclare, Calidus manifests wings, claiming to be one of the Ben Elam, Elion's blessed angels, after which the Jahar are convinced and agree to follow Nathair. Nathair and Varadis then return home and witness the eclipse on Midwinter's Day. Aquilus confronts and condemns Nathair for working with the Vinthalan, asking to speak with him in private. A muddled series of events then occurs which ends in King Aquilus' death and Nathair suffering from a stab wound and blaming King Mandros for the murder. This makes Nathair High King and Varadis his first sword. Varadis leads a revenge campaign into Carnatan and ultimately kills King Mandros. Although Mandros claimed Nathair killed Aquilus and then stabbed himself to make Mandros look like the killer. Varadis is then sent to Romar to fight the Hunan giants who have stolen the Starstone Axe a powerful relic, and one of seven ancient treasures possessing great power. There, along with Calidus and the giant Alcyon, they hunt the Hunan to their ancient burial site. Working with King Romar, the original owner of the axe, after fighting off the giants, Calidus then betrays Romar, killing him and his men, including Castel, and seizing the axe. Corbin is the young son of a blacksmith, living in the fortress Dunkerig capital of the country of Arden. Corbin and his family attend a wedding where Corbin is bullied by older kids and saved by his sister Cuin. He visits the nearby forest alone and has a strange vision following his encounter with a bleeding stone. Afterward, he saves a Wolden's life and returns to Dunkerig, shaken by the strange events. Later that day, a farm inhabited by one of Corbin's friends and his family is burned by bandits from the forest. The entire family is murdered. Corbin is taken under the wing of Gar, a mysterious stable master, to begin training for the Rowan Field, a sparring ground for boys once they reach the age of 14. He proves to be skilled with a sword and begins to get stronger as his training progresses. Evnis, advisor to King Brennan, takes a cadre of men to the tunnels of Dunkerig, and after defeating a white worm, steals a powerful book which grants him access to earth power. He is searching for the cauldron one of the seven starstone treasures, which could heal his ailing wife. Unfortunately, she dies and his venom toward King Brennan of Arda grows. Corbin also becomes apprentice of Brenna, a local healer who owns a talking crow. She is called a witch by some of the townsfolk, though Corbin begins to trust her. He is gifted a cult by his father, and over the following months, eventually excels, earning him high regard in the Rowan field. While accompanying some of Dunkerig's men on a hunt, Corbin encounters a pack of wolven, including the one he saved, 
Ebnis and his men arrive and kill the entire pack save one cub, which Corbin takes into his arms. He claims the king's justice, and after a heated exchange in the throne room, is told by the queen he may keep the wolven and raise it as his own. Though if it causes anyone harm, it is to be immediately put to death. He names the wolven Storm. Kiwin, Corbin's sister, witnesses King Aquilus's advisor, Michal, speak with their parents. The trio have a cryptic conversation about Corbin, and Kiwin overhears something about Corbin having a great destiny ahead of him. As the book draws to a close, Nathair goes to Arden and learns that the threat of the outlaws has been eliminated. But he has arrived in Arden amidst a military development. Owain, king of the neighboring country of Narvon, believes King Brennan killed his son. This is all due to Queen Rin's machinations. During Nathair's stay, Owain's forces suddenly arrive, quickly carving a destructive path to Brennan's capital. Evnis betrays Brennan and opens the gates for the invading force. The city is overrun by Owain and his men. A desperate fight ensues in the palace. After Owain's siege succeeds, Kiwin falls from the city gates while fighting. Her and Corbin's father, Thanon, dies protecting Brennan from Evnis. Nathair, along with his eagle guard, also turn on King Brennan, and along with Evnis, manage to slay the king. Corbin, his mother Gwyneth, Princess Idana, now queen, Gar, Brynna, and others escape the fortress as it's attacked. They use the tunnels underneath the fortress and eventually find a ship. They set out for Domhain, a kingdom to the west, as Halion reveals himself to be the bastard son of Domhain's king. But first, they must pass Cambrin, land of villainous Rin, who has close ties to Azroth. Corbin's mother says she has to tell him something at the end of the story, but he tells her to wait. Woo! There was so much there. Just in reading that, I had to like start giggling and like redo some sentences because I was like, there's just so many events and this and that and this and this and this person and that person. Yeah. So for anybody that's listening right now, um, so Chad and I are are doing this first episode for this series in one episode. The first book is one episode. That's what we've had planned on. We are we have decided after this book we're doing two episodes per book because this was the if you listen to that recap that sorry that was a lot and we had to split it up between Veratus and corbin and then kind of like there's still stuff that we didn't even get to that there's we're gonna huge have to chunks talk left about. out yeah. but I, we kind of skipped along the major important stuff but it's i mean i feel bad right because like even in the last like paragraph we reveal like halion the first time he's ever been mentioned yeah. like who's, so who's this, this guy? there's, there's so much to book. it I, I i wasn't able to find a single recap of this book uh on the internet at all and usually we have pretty good luck with that and we'll just kind of like like we still write mostly write our own recaps and stuff but we just kind of like take inspiration from it's nice to uh, have a foundation it's nice to have a foundation that we kind of like add or like subtract stuff uh, as we see fit um and then kind of like write it the way we want it to be for these episodes but with this one this was difficult this was a really <laughs> there was so was much going difficult. on so uh just so you all know we are splitting every book into two episodes which i think will help a lot with you know how long the recap is um and kind of just like keep us more consistent with posting and stuff um so totally you don't have like one kind of like messy episode every two or three weeks every two yeah. or three weeks yeah i read this book in three or four days and i think it really helped me to just like read it all in one fat chunk and so i think it'll help you our listeners if you're not reading these books to hear it and, you know, to get one a week very consistently as half a book, half a book, half a book. And I think that will really help the overall understanding and comprehension of the events therein. And also we can get a little more detailed with yeah, our Yeah, exactly. Recaps. We won't be missing things because like in this recap, we, we didn't even cover Camlin. We didn't cover Castell really. Though, Castell. I mean, Castell was... <laughs> Was he, he really necessary? Re- no, yeah. not at all. Like, I mean, I was like, I liked the I chapters. trying to weave him in when I wrote some of this um, recap, and I was like, what? this is already huge. And he doesn't, you could totally pull him from the book, and he's like, it doesn't even matter. I mean, he matters in this. I, I think there's a lot of world building done in the Castell chapters. Uh, there's some pretty yeah. exciting fights going on. I mean, I appreciated them, but yeah, I mean, eventually, Veratis and Castell are in the same place. And. It's just like, what is this guy doing here? And I mean, he and so Castell gets killed by his cousin Jail, I think is his name, 
Um, yeah, they had, like I think this so, jail, feud going on for like the entire book, and Castell even at one point is like, "Jail, like our 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 uncle Romar is going to name one of us as his successor. Like we need to put yeah, this we feud put behind, this behind us. us." But then there's like something weird going on with Castell's dad that like Jail has a problem with. Yeah, but it's all because. Castell just like got the best of him in a fight in a ring, like a a like a trial match that I they mean, were having. He did, like, need he him did in the like knee him in the in the groin, yeah. Which yeah, is, but like, to have definitely... a blood feud feud to the death, like I think on, it was Dale. already pretty bad, and then he did that, and it's kind of pushed it over the edge. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it, that's he what it uh, he is like. definitely put and pushed in my mind to the Azroth side of this equation for sure, though. Jail, anyway. oh jail, yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Um. Yeah, I had to read that whole part a couple times, the very last part where they're in like the 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 giant tomb or whatever that was, um just to kind of like understand exactly what was going on. So the Vin Thaloon and the Jaher, uh, was it all of them that kind of turned on Romar or was it just Calidus that turned on Romar? I think it was all of them. It was all of cuz like Ver- Veratus I think had a few of his people there as well and then it was Calidus, it was Calidus and Alcyon. And then I think they had some other Vinthalon. And I think most of the Jahar were actually with Nether being his eagle guard. Because I remember them facing off and then having this kind of reveal where Gar, the mysterious trainer of Corbin, was like, but da massively awesome, super good swordplay. And, and Corbin was like, I realize now that he was just toying with me. What a master swordsman <laughs> who was like faking his limp this whole time. And then the like head of the Jahar was like, where have you been all these years? Yeah, You're totally. on the wrong side. And he's like, no, you're on the wrong side. <laughs> ding, ding. And they fight each other and uh, neither die. I believe. I think they both like to fight another day ish and then part ways. Yeah. Um, I think that one of the reasons that I like this series so much is because it kind of smashes together the farm boy chosen one trope, or at <laughs> least, I mean, he seems like he's the chosen one at the end of this book. Corbin. And then, yeah, and then yeah, but it sure. also kind of like mixes in the kind of like grittier setting of like a Song of Ice and Fire or First Law. You know, there's yeah. a lot of conventions in here I really appreciate, but they're mixed in with some kind of like darker landscapes and events. So it's interesting because you know this, this the chosen one trope has been done so many times, but also Too many times it hasn't been done in a while. Actually, like nothing. At least I it's haven't like read it in a while. You fresh know, it's, again. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's fresh again. It's new age fun with a vintage feel. <laughs> yeah, because I was gonna. One of my questions here was I was gonna ask you like, did you think that this was too tropey? Because there is a lot of cl- there's like a ton of classic tropes in this. The prophesied good and bad one. The wise mysterious man who is teaching, uh, you know, our from poor upbringings young hero who is a sword master. The wild cub everyone wants to kill, but the hero adopts it. Did you think that it was enough freshness of the spins that were put on them to be like, okay, we've taken the tropes and like made something new from them? Or were you kind of like, oh my gosh, I really, there was only one time that I was like, I roll. Yeah, I never really rolled my eyes at this. I mean, I feel like there was just like, I was intrigued enough by the potential that I saw in this first book and for the rest of the series too. I mean, the characters weren't anything super special. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, yeah. I liked Corbin. I liked Veratis. I think I liked Veratis the most. I think Veratis was probably the character I thought um, was the he's most He's got some real dark times ahead of him because he's going to yeah. be, he's becoming like more and more like attached to Nether, but he's also becoming kind of clouded about like his opinion towards him. Do you notice that when he goes into battle, he kind of has this like Nether driven, like bloodlust. He's like, Nether, and then just like goes crazy. So I think he's going to probably do some things that he regrets. And then in non battle times be like, man, am I becoming evil or yeah? What? I mean, I think Veratus uh, spent most of his life trying to impress his father and his mm-hmm. brother. Uh, his brother still kind of treats him like a kid and his father has absolutely zero respect for Veratus. So it makes a lot of sense that once Nether kind of took him under his wing, Veratus was 100% team Nether. You know what I mean? Yeah, like just yeah. right in there and would do anything for him. So I, I think he's a pretty well-rounded character. I mean, I like reading, I, I, like I said, like I liked reading the Veratus chapters the most out of Me anything. Uh, very closely followed by Corbin. I think that the Corbin chapters were good, except they felt a little bit like I don't know, like disconnected a little bit. It's like, yeah, we've got like all with... these epic big things happening and then we've got like farm boy, farm boy, like, yeah. <laughs> um, but that's kind of like another reason why the tropes kind of worked for me is because I feel like half of this story was Veratus and Castell 
dealing with the the big like overarching issue with the series right. and then you've got corbin and the stuff going on even with camlin and stuff too it's like a lot more localized and so i felt like i kind of was reading two books at the same time here which was interesting the one thing that i found to be a little eye rolly was there was a conversation between corbin and i believe gar and corbin's like i'm not brave at all because like, i was super fearful in battle and then he was like yeah but actually bravery is being fearful and still standing your ground i was like <laughs> oh like oh my god this is ridiculous it's uh, straight from uh, the eddard stark like the only yeah time it was just like okay when he's afraid not yeah, turning so. over any new stones on this conversation definitely not <laughs> nope nope not even a little uh so i have some like really specific questions that i want to get into things that i was just like a little bit hazy on my chief question my, my number one question and i really hope you can clear this up for me why were adana like the princess and kuin and the queen of arden out in the forest when they all got attacked man what were they doing out there do you know what Kewin did i Adana miss something like buddies and i guess the queen decided to like come along for uh, why like i don't know i don't know were they was there were they like on a mission to go find like something I, I that was the one part know. of the book where i was like really unclear i was just like this is none of this should only be like warriors out here in the forest like it's been right. explained to us this entire time that like the baglan is like this really dangerous forest it's obviously got bandits that are hell-bent on burning down entire houses and murdering all the people inside them why is the queen and princess in this forest at all there's no reason they should be in there <laughs> you right. know i like the whole thing i really i mean that that was like really a big turning point for me in the in the books where that stuff was going on because i as much as it didn't really make sense that they were there i still liked the scenes a lot like when corbin and gar and i think merrick uh like all kind of like sneak up on um the the red shirts i guess is what they were called they were like the gray team and then there was like the red team uh <laughs> i see why gwen did that it's a lot easier to write out that fight scene instead of totally like, um but it was just uh it was a really fun part i mean you got to see corbin kind of like mature a little bit more you know like he had to go through this actual fight and he'd never seen anything like that nor had a, a lot of his peers also the ones that have been kind of giving him a hard time for this entire book like he grew up a lot faster and i liked seeing that quite a bit um but yeah that was strange and if you're listening right now and you've read these books please email me directly and tell me why the queen and her daughter were out and it, it results in the were queen dying traveling somewhere else maybe they go into like the some state remember. or something i have yeah. no idea i must have spaced because uh I, was, I did this half audiobook and half um same reading it and uh i think i kind of just was spacing on something right before all that stuff happened so i missed something but please let me know yeah if there was any part that i was like okay maybe we're too many groups here was when we got into the, i did like the bandit groups like as a standalone unit but they were just like one more group of people and then like their leader turns out to be like one of the queen's agents like planted queen for queen rin's agents yeah. planted for so long so she could like have him do some stuff that would make some of the other kings think that this king did it and like start you know enter turmoil between them uh but it was just I understand the necessity for them, but man, at that point I was like full up of names and I was like, oh, we got a whole slew, like a whole nother band of people. Um, though I did really like Camlin and Braith was kind of cool, but I really liked um, the Camlin character and I was kind of like, I don't kill youngins. <laughs> yeah, and Braith was just like, ah, this is just the way it is right now. Yeah, sometimes man. Like, you might have to, though. Sometimes man. <laughs> you kill some kids. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Come on to, I, I'm looking at which way the wind is blowing, you know, like it's Queen Rin. They killed the entire farm group that was um, Corbin's friends, right? I'm quite certain. Yeah, the bandits. They yeah, killed, yeah, totally. They killed uh, in, the, in the beginning of the book. Yeah, uh huh. Um, cool. I don't know. Cool. I also thought that like the Queen Rin and Owain thing seemed a little bit like tossed in at the end. Yeah, it's kind of like it was. I didn't. 
like I know that Rin. I had to like go back and reread the prologue, and yeah, yeah the prologue Queen really Rin, helped. Yeah, like the prologue is very important. Uh, Queen Rin obviously is in league with Azroth and everything. I'm super on board with all that, but then it's like, aha, like we made o- Owain think that Ardan killed Owain's son, so now he wants to, and it's all like Queen Rin's machinations. Aha! Yeah, and I was yeah. like, wait, where the hell did all of this come from? Like, this is okay. Like, I guess that's what's right. going on right now. Yeah. Yeah. It was so okay. One of my problems with the because this is kind of Game of Thronesy in the amount of characters and like the scope of them, like from the littlest pretty, to yeah, the it's biggest. Comparable for sure. Yeah. And one thing that Martin did that I think is superior is that he introduced them maybe not slowly. Like we got a lot, but we would spend a long. His chapters were really long, and so we'd really get a lot of time with these one characters and like learn to grow with them a bunch and like get used to them. So by the time they came around again, I was like, oh yeah, that guy. But these chapters were really short, and I feel like we would jump from character to character to character to character. And by the time we'd come back to one, I'd be like, who is this person again? And I yeah. just had to reference my dramatis personae. Fortunately, I made myself a ginormous one, um, and it really helped. But yeah, I think that a little bit more time with each character, especially for the first couple times that we're with them, would have been really helpful. Yeah, I mean, another thing that Martin did that was really brilliant was in the beginning of A Game of Thrones, the first book in A Song of Ice and Fire, he has pretty much all the main characters in one place, and then he disperses them. So, like, they all meet at Winterfell. So, like, Cersei's there, Robert's there, Eddard, all of the Stark children, all of the Lannister kids, all or I guess the Baratheon kids. And that was clever. Like, like Jaime was there. Like, it it set, like, every every character chapter every main character was in one place and so Before they the all diaspora. like mingled with each other and talked to each other and stuff and then they all split apart uh and then so it made it very easy it's just like okay we're in winterfell here's everybody you know and but with this book it, it's not necessarily a bad thing you know i mean like i think one of the strengths that gwyn has here is in the beginning of the book we're seeing a lot of different places and we're seeing what the key places are like right away like tenebral mm-hmm. is really important arden is really important you know what i mean so like uh kind of seeing all of this kind of at the same time was is also good it's just a lot more to keep track of you know because you know even in the in the first castell chapter he's like i really want to go back to like this i can't even remember the name of the stronghold in the I can't in the country. Is I can't Dun- remember. Carrick? It's like Isseltir. I think. Um, oh no, not Don Carrick. I think uh, Castell and and his friend, which isn't Michael, but it sounds like Michael. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like because Michael is uh, King Aquilus's dude, and so like like uh, Castell and his friend McQueen. McQueen. Yeah, Castell yeah. and McQueen are from I think Isseltir, and there's like. So it's not just Isseltir. Isseltir. Yeah, nice work. He's so a baron not, of Isseltir. So it's not just Isseltir that they're talking about. It's like this stronghold in Isseltir that they're talking about. So it's like, and they're not even there. You know what I mean? So it's right. like, so it's like they're they're like leading this wagon train, and and Castell is thinking about his cousin Jail, and he doesn't want to go back to like this specific stronghold, and they're from Isseltir, but they're like moving away from Isseltir into like this other country, and it's just like, whoa, oh my god, there's so much going on here. Wow, um, but. You are also seeing a lot of the landscape. You're seeing a lot of things talked about that are really important all at the same time. So that's fine. Um, it's just a little bit more work on the reader's side, I think. Yeah, I could not agree more. I don't think it was too much, but I do think it could have been a little bit better delivered to us. Like some of the world build- building, I kind of felt was like he just took his notes and then like added dialogue tags to the beginning and end. And it was just like sometimes it's like dun, da, 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 da. like it was very formulaic and just like I don't know one of the things with that's so wise and and clever in Game of Thrones as well is there's like emotional attachments attached to all the places so I remember them like by the end I was like looking up like Tenebral is that like a person or a place like, like I had to it wasn't connected in my mind you know maybe that would have helped by starting them all off in one ca- one spot like you said but I don't know I just thought that there was not it was really confusing and it could have been done delivered better in my opinion i mean one thing to remember is this is john gwynn's debut novel so yeah i think uh what i've heard about this series is that malice is the weakest one in the series and then it just keeps getting better and then there's a sequel series which i think you read the first book of the sequel series 
uh, the it's like dread. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh huh. And then it was great. I think it's called the time of dread or something like that. I think so. Yeah. And then, but so there's those two and then this new one, um, I think it's called the blood war blood sworn saga. The first book is called, uh, shadow of the gods, I believe, or hunger of the gods. I can't remember which one's the first one, but apparently those ones are like amazing, like really, really good. And I mean, I wouldn't call this book amazing. Uh, no. I would definitely say it's really, it was like, a, it's like addicting though. There's something about it that's like, once you're kind of sitting and reading it and you, I think the short chapters are actually kind of cool. I mean, I agree with you in the sense that more time with the characters, even at first, you know, like if I had had like a 40 page long Veratus chapter and then a 40 page long Corvin chapter, and then you know what I mean? It would have right. You could have gotten used to the characters more, but the punchy story did aid to the excitement. Right, exactly. Story. I mean, I think I don't think that Gwyn is I trying agree. to write a Game of Thrones type thing here. I think he's trying to obviously he's trying to do his own thing, but I think also the the pacing is a little bit faster. You know what I mean? Like we're getting some pretty poppy stuff happening like really, oh, really yeah. fast. I mean, like there's there's chapters in A Song of Ice and Fire that are just just like it's it really is just people sitting there you know what i mean and, yeah. and, and then it's fine i'm not knocking that at all but i think that with this there's a little more action you know i mean like uh, veratus is jumping through fire and fighting a giant early right. on in this book you know like corbin is getting beat up by these kids and saving a wolf out in the forest and seeing his friend's farm burnt down in the first like right. hundred pages like there's there is like of... shield wall and then like two chapters later he's using that shield wall to right, face exactly. off against there's, the giants which yeah. i really enjoyed actually that was yeah, awesome no and it's the cool lizards are great the lizards are awesome like mean, there's so many parts of this that work so well i think that i'm gonna re need to read the rest of the series to decide whether or not i think that the whole is worth the sum of, uh, is worth the sum of its parts um I think uh, there's not really a whole lot in here that made me not want to read it, though. There's, there's like, a, like I said before, there is like kind of this addicting kind of like pace and addicting uh, development that's mm -hmm. really exciting. I mean, like every time you're with Nether and Veratus, like I, like I said at the beginning of this episode, like I was suspicious of Nether, like pretty much immediately. You know, you, you know, know, like and go ahead. that I think is one of the cleverest things of these books is people love to be right and they love to be like one step ahead of the characters, you know? And yeah. I think there's a really, he does a really good job in writing in where you're like, I know what's going on here. Nathair's actually the bad one. Veratus is going to be super confused, but Corbin is the good one. And it's just like, it's not very hard to figure out, but it still makes you feel very accomplished because you get it before everyone else does, you know? See, and that's really cool. Um, I, I mean, I think that one of the things that's really effective here is that Nathair is the hero of his own story and me as the reader i'm like dude no this is and i'm really excited to see how this all develops with because now that i've gotten to know nether more i want to see what his reaction is to in the information that basically says no you're for actually for azroth like is he going to change do you think or do you think he's going to kind of like go along with it anyway i like, i think the powers that be will go will work very hard to continue convincing him that he is the light one. Oh, you think it'll be drawn out a little bit more oh, than yeah, okay sure. yeah that makes a lot he's more sense he's gonna think actually. that he's the good yeah. guy until a long time and then he's gonna be like well maybe we need to use the powers of evil to accomplish good things and then like <laughs> oh i see what you're saying yeah that might yeah uh what do you think Veratus is gonna do though do you think he's gonna stick his storyline i'm far more interested in because yeah, he's gonna absolutely He's going to pretty quickly realize, I think, somewhere in the middle of next book, he's going to be like, wait a second. Yeah. My like lizard riding lord <laughs> over here, Mr. Yeah. Who wants to unite the empire under one ruler that just so happens to be himself, um, <laughs> <laughs> is actually the bad one. Man, I think he's going to have, I'm really interested to see what happens with him because he's going to have this like conflict because Nathar is like his friends. They made like a blood oath as like brothers and besties. At, yeah. at like you know two thir a third of the way into this book and so i think he's going to live through the next book and i think by the end of this next book he will either be about to leave nathair or very close to it why do you think aquilas even like called the meeting like uh, is there sufficient evidence that this god war would basically destroy like why not just let the two gods duke it out 
because part of the prophecy is that each god will have a champion that will need to rally well the black sun will rally a bunch of men that will basically like end humanity as we know it unless the bright star joins forces with like all of the goodly folk and they fight so it's like this battle will be fought not only in the it's like, like proxy heavenly war. realm yeah it's yeah. like a proxy war okay, however yeah. it does mention that the angels of each god will be involved as well like the ben elim will come down and fight whatever their um counterpart is i don't know the names of um azeroth's ben, angels yeah the ben elim is for uh elion and then azeroth's angels are called the Kadoshim. The Kadoshim. But to answer your question, I think that the signs of... Um, I, I'm not sure if Aquilus saw any of the worms come back, but there's been like stirring along the borders of the giants coming back as they were kind of broken um, and and cast away. And then there's like the um, the the bloods, the, the bloods, the stones bleeding. There's like that's happening throughout the land. And I believe, you know, the final nail in the coffin of like this is happening was the eclipse i believe that happened on right. midwinter's day totally so this is definitely going down for sure yeah um, so one of the things also that i that i was kind of just like nether come on man like when he when he has that conversation with his dad king aquilus and he find and aquilus finally finds out that Nether has been working with the Vintaloon, and then he's like, Oh yeah, it's like this guy Calidus. And his dad is basically just like, Bro, like, no the one like, thing. <laughs> no, like, like not those guys. Like, I know more about this than you. And Nether is right. just like, Well, how about I just keep doing exactly what I'm doing? <laughs> okay, boomer. <laughs> just like does like, his own dude, thing. <laughs> no, don't do that. Um, so I have a question uh, which which really relates to these these events and the the thing that these events lead up to is King Aquilus's murder. He was murdered, for but sure. I'm starting to think it was Nether. Oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely Nether, <laughs> definitely 100 percent Nether. Uh, you know, and I think he just stabbed himself to make it look like he was, and I think that's probably going to be one thing that Veratus finds out because Veratus went on the revenge campaign and was told by the king that he was supposed to kill who did it. And that king was like, before he killed him was like, nah, man. Yeah. Like Nether just made that up. Like, and it and really then, checks out. Cause he's like, what was I supposed to do? Just hang around, you know, like when right. I was the last, and you know, initially when I first read that chapter, which is, it's a very good chapter. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite parts of the whole book actually is, um, Veratus going on like this revenge campaign um because in my mind like when i'm reading it i was just like yeah go get him like he killed the king like he stabbed nether like come on right uh but then Revenge once they up. once they catch up with him it's mandros is that his name i think it is mandros uh, yeah. yeah once they catch up with him and he's just like no here's actually what happened i was like oh that actually nether is kind of sketchy and nobody else was there and this is actually making a lot of sense and then Veratus just cuts his freaking head off like, yeah Oh boy. And then they're just like, okay, we'll just tell everybody that Mandros died in battle. Um, yeah, is- that's what I think that kind of that bloodlust that takes uh, Veratus over, where he's just like, nothing, and like fights yeah. just for him. And then later is like, man, I kind of regret that. That was a little <laughs> sketchy of me because he's still a good person inside. Um, okay, I have a question for you. Calidus says that he united the Vin Thalun. And then, but like, it's mentioned that someone with whose names start with an L is the Lycos. king of Lycos is the king yeah. of the Vinthalon. So did Calidus not really, or was he just kind of like the, what, what position I guess does he have in the Vinthalon is my question. I'm not really sure. Okay. Like he's just, I think like maybe counselor or something. It's like pretty high up. Uh, doesn't seem like Lycos has as much sway as Calidus does. You know? Yeah. Or at least he seems I the mean, real Calidus ruler. is Calidus is a Kadashim. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, so, For sure. There's some maybe there's some sort of like influence Calidus is having on Lycos. Mm, you know what I mean? Magical. And and uh by extension, like maybe he really did unite the people of the Vinthalun, but like maybe Do you think they're... Alcyon is too? Uh a Kadashim? Yeah, uh-huh. I don't know if giants are uh the are either Kadashim or what are well, they? Well it could just called? be a he could just be like um, you know, a like a projection or whatever, you know, it's like a, Oh yeah. I don't know what Alcyon's deal is. Um, he definitely does not seem to be on the side of the giants seeing as he's killing 
multiple of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Man. I don't know. I want to know more about uh, Alcyon for sure. Nether is kind of, he also was a little eye rolly sometimes because it's like, man, like people who have united kingdoms that have thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of warriors and have like united these clans of Vinthalan are now like bowing before him and everyone's just doing what he says and Alcyon's like, oh, you want a lizard mount? I'll go get you one. No problem. And it's like, come on, man. I mean, man. it kind of makes don't sense. Don't you think, like, don't you think that they're just like buttering you up a I little mean, bit in maybe, the fair? Sit back would, and think. I would be a lot more skeptical about it if I had been born like common, but remember Nathar's a prince of the high yeah, king. Like he's you're been right. kind he of, does assume. Yeah, like I mean, like why the, wouldn't it be him in right. his mind? You know? So like, yeah, I can see why you roll roll your eyes just a little bit, but also I mean Nathar I think Nathar and Veratis specifically are the best written characters in this this book, at least. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't have an issue with uh, Corbin or anything like that. I think Camlin is fairly interesting. Castell was okay. But yeah, the Veratis and the Thera are the most complicated so far. Yeah. Why did you think? Because there's this sequence where the god, I'm pretty sure that it's Azroth. Is that the gods? What's the gods? Yeah. Or, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Azroth that shows up to Corbin and he's like, I want you, you to be the. He calls him the bright one, but he we all yeah. know that it was the black sun. And so does Corbin, who figures it out. And he's like, no, this feels wrong. And But why do you think the god wanted Corbin instead of Nathair? I mean, I think he knew that Corbin was the bright star. Right. So if he um, could get him right. as it's the like, black sun, so he's like one already. Yeah. And then Nathair... And then Nathair would be a little bit easier to sway too, but Nathair is not the bright star. No. Right? So he can make he can convince Nathair that he's the bright star, you know, but he's not for sure. Right. Um, but with Corbin, like Corbin is, so he's got to like do a little more, you know. I uh, I didn't think about that, but you're right. He would have just won already if he would have take gotten Corbin to do it. Oh, I was thinking like yeah. Corbin is a more convincing fake bright sun or bright star than uh Nathair is like everyone's going to figure out pretty quickly that Nathair is not the good one he's the bad one but corbin however he's a little bit more tricky because he's like actually a good guy deep in his heart you know it would and be so, pretty interesting if corbin actually turned out to be the the black sun which i don't think is true like i don't think i don't think so too yeah um that'd be okay, pretty interesting though it would be someone who i thought was kind of Got the short end of a little uh, of a few sticks here is Kiwin, who first off I think should name should be pronounced Kiwin because C Y W E N it should be Kiwin and it sounds cooler, but Kiwin I will go with. I think she's she's such a cool character and has so much potential, but then is really and is like the only female character that's POV that's we get a lot of time with, and then she's just used as like a world building tool a way for us to see through her eyes conversations that happen about her brother or for her just i don't know i felt like she was just used for us to learn about the story advance the story and learn about the world and then not really ever do anything that was cool or be yeah. independent and i don't know i just thought she was kind of a pawn of the story and yeah. i was like come on she's cool yeah she was really cool i thought she was more interesting than corbin actually yeah <laughs> like, straight up and it, it really bummed me out that some of those chapters i mean like it's it's like the chapters from kewin's perspective were still about corbin you know right what I mean? right and she's just hiding in the garden hearing yeah, about corbin's awesomeness yeah. future um and then you know we get a chapter where she's basically just taken captive and then like throws a yeah. couple knives kind of and it's like oh yeah like you super talented but like doesn't really matter yeah. you know but it's really then, only so corbin can like go see yeah, her and be like i yeah. was afraid in battle and like i'm kind of with you yeah kewin kewin was kind of the the bummer of the book in my opinion yeah in, the, in this not the character but just in the sense where it's just like man it would have been pretty awesome if she had a little bit more like agency and more stuff yeah. to do where um, do you think her storyline's going because as far as know. we know we don't know if she's alive or dead she fell from the yeah the i think she's alive the i think she's alive happy. maybe it'd be cool if she had pov chapters in the next book where she's trying to yeah, catch up with everybody else that would like an aria start kind of thing i know yeah yeah i know we keep referencing a song of license by everybody but <laughs> it's gonna keep is, happening it's gonna keep happening but yeah having her kind of have a little bit more agency and a little bit more complexity would be pretty awesome because it seemed like she was a pretty great character but then just not a whole lot happened with her um yeah same with 
Camlin, I think Camlin was pretty cool, but honestly, I think I kind of agree with you that like Castell maybe was a little unnecessary and we could have had more from Camlin. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I feel like this book series is so vast and there's so many people that it's, I don't know, it feels a little bit of a waste to me to spend so many pages with someone who is now dead. And you're like, cool. So, like, that was like a waste of my mental brain. Like, I don't know. Like bandwidth, I was saying before, you know? I think, uh, I think Castell and Kuin to a certain extent were, you know, just uh, world building uh, tools, you know. Yeah, uh, you're totally right. At least that's, that's uh, the benefit that I'm seeing to reading those chapters, I should say. But I think uh, Kuin is not dead. I I think she, we would have seen her death on the page. Um, yep, totally. I don't think you would take a point of view character and then just have them descend into darkness, and then it's like the last you ever see of them. <laughs> totally. Um, but with, at least because with Castell, it's like it shows him getting murdered by his cousin. You know, so uh, I don't think Kewin is dead. Um, Do you think she's going to be captured, or is she going to be like hiding out sure. in the town? I don't I think know. she's going to be hiding out in the town. Maybe she'll That's be hiding. Thinking. Yeah, because yeah wayne kind of took everything over i felt bad for brennan like his wife died yeah and then he's just kind of like in this despondent like i don't really care about anything kind Evnis of betrays him like his main counselor yeah we can talk about Evnis a little bit because uh i feel like Evnis is pretty important and he didn't get a whole lot of chapters but i liked the chapters that he had yeah it was hard for me to understand his motivation like it was he just kept being like, but my wife, but my wife. And then I was like, finally figured out like, oh, that's why he ends up bet betraying Brennan because Brennan nor his wife allowed him to go pursue the cauldron to find it and use it to heal his wife. And thus he's like, screw you guys. I'm going to betray you, I guess. I mean, in the beginning of the book, this uh, like 20 years beforehand, he had made a deal with Azroth and Queen Rin. That's for, right. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it was I think long that, before then, I think it was kind of like side. adding fuel to the fire that uh, Evnis's wife died because Brennan couldn't be bothered to let him go do the thing that would right. probably save her. Which he was I like, was no, weak. my wife can't do this on her own. She needs but you. But she like very clearly can, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, totally. Like, <laughs> like involves him in no decisions. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, I liked Alona um, a lot, actually. The scene where um, Corbin brings Storm, his newfound uh, woven mm -hmm. pup, into the throne room. And I thought the queen handled that really, really well, actually. I yeah. liked that whole scene a lot. Um, I like Storm a lot. I hope we get to see more of Storm. I really um, like that scene between Corbin um, and whoever was like the bully figure that, like, was like, oh, let's. And then he like challenges. There were like him. A, a few different bully characters. So there was <laughs> yeah, there Raph was. or Rafe, um, who is somebody's son. The guy who Rafe is the son of the guy that Corbin's dad Thanon fights. When <laughs> that was a pretty funny scene too. It's like Corbin's was dad was just scene, like, yeah. I'm gonna show you how to fight with words and how words are really important. And then he just gets in a fight like immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I love nice that. words, yeah, dude. <laughs> that was really funny. Um, but yeah, that's Rafe. And then also we have Vaughn, who is the son of Evanus. Um, and Vaughn seems to have a bit of a vendetta against um even more so than Rafe, like against Corbin. Um, that's right. Yeah, but uh Evnis, definitely I wish we could have gotten a little bit longer chapters from him. I kind of see why they were so short though. They were very punchy, and Evnis definitely I think needs to be a little bit mysterious until like the end of like the whole time I was just like, what the hell is up with this guy? Like this right. guy is, this guy is evil. <laughs> Cause he gets like access to earth magic pretty early on, but like what yeah. that means, I have no idea. And then he's basically like, I know where, cause he gets like a, um, a note or something from Rin. She's like, this is where the cauldron is. And he's like, great, let me go find it. And then he's not allowed to by uh, King Brennan. Um, you know, one thing I do really like is we get told the story and we see this story unfold through the eyes of kind of the tertiary players, you know, not through any of the main like people leading the pincer formation, but we kind of get the second and third in command. We get to see the events from the moons revolving around the planet, so to speak. And it's a really cool and clever way of building the stories. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. Like this could have very easily been King Brennan, Prince Nathair, you know, yeah. like those those uh, specific POV chapters. But no, we're getting Camlin, we're getting Corvin, we're getting Veratus, you know, like these people that are connected to the bigger players 
but have maybe more interesting storylines like but i mean then again like i mean chapters from king brennan's perspective would have been pretty cool actually uh, especially once his wife died and stuff like but it then, but seeing you know brendan's reaction through the eyes of someone like corbin or kewin or um you know whatever is pretty good too uh, especially Cor uh, corbin growing up in den Carrig as long as he did and then seeing his king be this checked out like that like while he's got an army at the door you know like mm -hmm. that was pretty effective that was super effective i feel kind of bad for the jahar because they've like trained for generations to like fight for good and they're like immediately deceived and like there was not <laughs> one person that was like but wait are we sure yeah, that we're like not one being guy with by, wings like, shows up yeah and all of a one sudden, guy with wings yeah. and we got the sarin disc layer for sure <laughs> like come on uh what did you think of nathair's new strategy with regard to fighting uh the shield wall was a new idea for these armies who until now had basically just been like running at each other over an open field and suffering yeah, heavy and casualties one-on-one -on -one, kind of breaking the fight quickly breaking up into like one-on-one -on -one melees you know yeah which yeah, seems like so many people getting stabbed in the back honestly it kind of reminded me of the change in warfare in the american revolutionary war where before we had a more yes. like uh quote uh gentlemanly approach to warfare <laughs> line up and kill each yeah, other yeah we would just line you up can and reload faster oh my God. yeah that was and it's so funny because Idiotic. um you know the shield wall or like the i would call it like a phalanx almost uh, uh -huh, totally like it, that is a much more effective way of and you know i mean like i'm sure military historians and, and people that really nerd out on that stuff would point out all kinds of issues with that in its own right but you know this is a fantasy world um so and i mean i feel like a shield wall would work way better than just throwing hundreds of people at each other you know it's like a little bit more strategic um what did you think about like the opposition to the shield wall from uh king aquilus's i think it was his first sword or it was like one of his like higher up advisors um he was kind of just like i don't know about this and then they took it out in the field and it like super worked i just thought it was kind super of like worked. it was a little bit obtuse and like stubborn of that guy to just be like i don't know i feel like throwing right. hundreds of people at each other is really the way to go here you i know? like the honorable many people dying way of the old i mean you know anyone especially i'm sure when it comes to warfare who any young buck saying well i can do it better i'm sure is going to be met with opposition regardless of the merit behind the idea it would have felt a little i thought it was actually pretty cleverly invented because if you would have just been like aha shield wall uh it would have been a little like what but the ant sequence was he was like oh how do we get one like a bunch of small beings to overtake the large ones um and then i liked how they were almost defeated by the lizard and if it wasn't for the um what do they call it the hammer and anvil technique that he used where the shield wall was held him which was the hammer and then the and wait was the anvil and then the hammer comes in from behind him once the giants have been fully committed and then gets crushed behind him and it, they almost broke they were so close you know yeah, i will i think one of gwen's major strengths and i'm sure you would agree with me is his action his fight scenes his yeah. war scenes like i'm they were really very excited well blocked. yeah they're awesome they're they're, they're really awesome they're like some of the better ones i've read in a while actually yeah. they're very very good i'd say um I, i'm i think i'm probably more partial to abercrombie's way of doing it Same. uh but that's just that's abercrombie baby abercrombie you know, like, one of the biggest differences is Abercrombie uses a lot of terrain. Like every fight is about the terrain, and that is so accurate. And yeah. I feel like, anyway, I've never been in one of these fights, but like I feel like the terrain would be everything. And th these fights were very much around like formations and the shield wall and like tactics and strategy, which is great, but yeah. none of it involved the terrain, which. I thought, except with the exception of the mist, he did go a little misty at times. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think Gwyn is he's is getting there. Very, very good at writing these fight scenes, and I think that's yeah. one of the things that like it's like the the action beats, the fight scenes, and the actual like uh, overall story is what's really exciting me about this series. Um, the characters, I'm not super sold on them yet. Like, I'm not quite there with the characters. I think, with the exception of Veratus and Nathair, I'm a little bit like I don't know. Like, sure you know uh mm -hmm. corbin i think just as much as i love the tropes like very neatly fits into this farm boy like that's got more to him than meets the eye kind of thing like, oh he uh, is very I did, one thing i well one thing i really did like about corbin is um 
how upset he was at Kiwin for helping him. Um, I really liked that. And then that was resolved really, really well when he... Um, when is she helping him? All right. So Cor- uh, Corbin at the beginning of the book kind of gets beat up by Rafe and Vaughn and a couple right. of other kids. And then Kiwin comes in and helps him, like saves him basically. And so then for a while, he's kind of like ridiculed. is like, oh, your sister needs to fight your battles for you and all that stuff. And so that's that's good stuff right there but then it gets resolved very very well later on in the book when another kid is getting beat up on by these same kids and corbin steps in to help him and the kid reacts exactly the way that corbin did right that was really well done i liked that a lot so um, i think like oh this really came full circle (laughs) yeah right exactly he's just like oh yeah i kind of was annoyed about that too i kind of did the same thing super get this Um, i think that was dylan no someone uh, who ends up becoming his friend Feral. Feral. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think that was his name. I think you're right. I feel like I'm doing a pretty good job remembering. Dude, you are. You're like, really yeah, doing like a <laughs> great job. I, I'm very impressed. I don't have I'm the very, list in very front impressed. of me. You know, you have the list. I do. I have my. I haven't been like. It's. It's the problem with my list. Here's the problem with my list. Is it's so long that like many of these times I am going from memory because it's too long to take the time while we're like spitting off the bat here to find these characters though now that i have found the section pharrell a good friend though not initially is my notes with him hey. under corbell so or corbin so yeah <laughs> killed it man yeah um i so i think the only thing about corbin that it, that's kind of giving me pause is like i'm not sure how he's going to react to eventually being told that he's the i'm curious to see like how reluctant he is you know he knows like, already because he told his mom don't tell me i don't want to know <laughs> yeah. you know like right at the end she's like i have something to tell you like on the ship they're sailing away like the burning fortress is behind him and he's like he's like no ah, no nah, nah, don't tell me right now just like we'll have this moment <laughs> where like we're all alive, already been seeing gods in my dreams and stuff I yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like be. i got a wolf i got a sweet horse though where did his horse where did his horse what go? happened to his horse i can't remember yeah, also huh. uh this is not knocking uh gwen because shield. name people name shield. people whatever you want but like i don't think shield is a very good name for a horse. no <laughs> nice, neither is storm i think Shield's shield, fine storm is fine, fine. For it's a, just super basic bro yeah, storm but, like i mean if somebody was if somebody like introduced me to a, a horse-sized wolf and they were like this is storm i'd be like yeah sure that's a decent name for that thing like why not? Yeah, but if it was like, like Kiliandar the Tooth, you'd be like, yeah. <laughs> <That's> so, <I laughs> you mean, but like, why would Corbin think of that though? I don't know. You know? I mean, yeah, right. Storm is fine. <laughs> but like, Shield for a horse, like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, Shield is like a shield. It saved him once, right? Like, because it was like the shield for like, him. There's nothing it came like rushing in. Uh, yeah, I guess again, that's, when I mean, he was that's... getting bullied and was his shield. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, "Oh wow, you're naming your horse Shield." That's kind of yeah. weird. Uh, whatever. That's very. That's so nitpicky. It's like not even worth talking about. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think it's good. Before we, as we kind of wrap up here, I I will say I typically don't like like prophecy sequences, dream sequences, God sequences, flashbacks, those sort of things. Though I thought that they were sprinkled sparsely enough that it was like pretty artfully done. What were your thoughts? I think there's a lot of nuance with the prophecy and it's super duper vague, which I really like. Yeah. Um, the prophecy isn't hitting the reader over the head in any way, really. It's, it really feels like an actual part of this world. And like the fact that a lot of people don't take it very seriously, it's written from uh, like a long dead giant. Um, it's, it's cryptic and it's cool. I think it's, it works. Yeah. You know, I, I don't really have any issues with the prophecy. Um, I think it does a very good job at kind of like, building out a little bit of the world, showing you what needs to happen, showing you what's to come without being like this thing that we have to constantly reference and rely on for the story. Right. You know, um, we'll People see. Like, we haven't f- have to figure out the line. That's what we need to do. So we know yeah. where to go. It's like nothing like, like that, which is we, nice. We might. I mean, I'm, I'm curious to see in the next few books, like how much the prophecy comes into play and how much the characters really rely on it and how much the story really relies on it. Yeah. Um, well, I, th- I think, a good way to subvert the prophecy is to have it be misinterpreted or um maybe not right at all you know right which would be interesting to see um but yeah right. have I mean, it I don't, be I don't kind it. of the like have like a chicken or egg thing with the prophecy of like was the prophecy talking about events that were going to come or was the prophecy the reason that those events ended up happening in the 
totally. long run because yeah. people were looking for them. You know, um, I think Corbin is going to get one of the seven treasures pretty quick. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised about that. Yeah, um, that the, would complete the, his the ensemble. seven treasures thing. Like, kind of, I don't know. It gave me like Akatar vibes a Made little from bit. A comet that like, ruined the world. <laughs> like, I mean, I like that idea a lot. I mean, I'm just, I don't, I hope this doesn't turn into a grocery store trip. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't, I don't want this to turn into collect like, all the pieces. Yeah, um, I'm fine with that in video games, but with books, it's just, I don't know. Boring. I'm cool with like go find the stuff for sure, but. I hope it's interesting. Like I hope, right? I'm sure it will be. I mean, I have pretty high hopes for these books. You know, like there's some nitpicks I have. This is a debut novel and an extremely ambitious debut novel. Yeah, as I need well. to keep that in mind because it's very yeah, good for it's, for a debut novel. Yeah, it really is. And I mean, like I'm really excited. Like Chad and I haven't been able to do this episode for a few days because I've just been busy with so much stuff, and so has Chad. And um, typically, when we do these episodes, I don't like to read the second one or the, the next book in no. the series until I've we finished myself. the episode but I've, I've had valor sitting on my nightstand for like a few mm-hmm. days now and i really really want to read it you like, know read like, me read yeah, there's me. a lot of stuff i want to get to I've, I've heard that you know the pedal is straight to the floor for the rest of these uh awesome. these books and um they're long so like i said kind of at the top of the episode we are going to be doing two episodes per book from now on which i think is a very good call i think it's a much think better so idea um, it'll keep our consistency up and it'll keep honestly it'll keep the recaps that we write um from you know word by word much more manageable and not so incredibly long and arduous and we'll be able to cover more because in this episode i mean i'm sure we covered quite a bit but there's a lot of stuff we still haven't gotten to you yeah, know? like there's a lot of definitely. stuff we weren't able to cover um, and I think that it's just because so many things happen in this series. There's so much, There's uh, so much, but it's not really confusing. Like, I mean, like the only thing that's confusing is keeping all the names in order. And after the first book, I think I have a pretty good grasp on it. So yeah, I'm, I'm not very really impressed for someone it. who didn't write his own dramatis persona, which I can share mine with you if you want, but yeah, it seems like you really don't need it, but I will send it to you. Um, but you're killing bro. You're killing. Thank you. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's wrap this up with some predictions. Like, what do you think is going to happen? Like not okay. just for the next book, but like, how do you think this is all? Gonna... Oh boy. Yeah. I think this is going to end with, Let's start there. I'm going to and start big and then laser in. Um, I think this is going to end with Varanus teaming up with Corbin. No, no, no I, I wasn't trying to think of his name. I just had a realization that like maybe Kiwin is oh, the right star. Oh my God, that would be so How cool. cool would that be? And then I would uh. be like totally re- resurrected her kind of like trashed character that happened in this book <laughs> um i would be so stoked in fact i'm going to predict that's going to happen just because i would be so stoked if it did happen though i don't know that's what's going to happen in my mind <laughs> and they're going to together crush nathair after collecting a few of the treasures but in the end decide that the treasures are too powerful for one man to have and destroy them along with nathair and all the the calidus's people the evil angels. Kod- I can't remember their name. Kodashim? The kin- Kodashim? Kodashim. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Which is yeah. cool because anytime you get an em is like a plural in the Hebrew language, right? So Kodashim. And the Ben Elim, that's a very like um, Hebrew name as well. Um, oh, so I, I think he's that. pulling from that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know about Nathair being like the, the big bad. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if like... I mean, he's a tool. Right. But I would, I would say like... Um, Nathair it sounds like a useful idiot right now. And For I think sure. Maybe Calidus might be the real contender here. You know what I mean? Um, especially with Alcyon. I want to find out more about him. Um, I think Corbin mm-hmm. is the bright star. I think the book wouldn't have ended the way it did. You know, and I, I think it would be cool if it ended up being Kuin. Uh, I agree yeah, like with you. If- it's not. It's cute. What if my call was just like, it'll be one of your kids? And they're like, well, it's got to be the man child, right? Not Kiwin, because she's not even allowed on the war. It would be so cool. Please it would be. Do I that. agree with Please you. Do I have a feeling it's Corbin. <laughs> I uh, have a strong feeling you're right. I would well. love to be surprised. That'd be really cool. If it is Corbin, that's cool. I want to see how that all uh, plays out. I think uh, Veratus is going, I think a lot of Veratus' story is going to be him dealing with the knowledge that Nathair is the baddie. You know when do you I mean? think he's going to figure it out? In this next book, I think he'll in the next it book, out. me too. Yeah, Unless I don't think he's going like to a... leave 
with their side this next book though yeah, i think it'll kind of end with him being like oh no i wonder <laughs> i wonder like yeah that's why i like Ferratus so much it's like how far is he willing to kind of like keep like be willfully sworn. ignorant yeah and that means a lot that's, to him yeah willfully, sure. that's a good statement that you just yeah. said how long is he willing to keep willfully ignorant because yeah. eventually he will know and then he'll have to switch up um I like those predictions. To laser in a little bit, I think that this next book, Kiwin is not going to be captured, or at least not initially. She's not going to start off in a dungeon. I think she's going to start off like behind some barrels in like a <laughs> stable somewhere, and then she's going to go like all terrorist on Owain, who now holds the fortress, and start just causing havoc. That's a good prediction. Um, yeah. I think I think Kiwin is going to try to catch up with her brother and her mom, and we're going to get. Does a she even bit of know that. they left though? She'll figure it out. She will, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I think it would be really cool to get some more information on the giants. Yeah. Um, I I feel like that was kind of one of the things that was missing here. Um, yeah. I want I want more like giant culture and I want more just what what do the giants think about all this? You know what right. I mean? Like why they did have like that one scene where they kind of like caught a giant alive. Which That's I thought right. was that was good. That was good. I want more of that kind of stuff, though. He just laughed a bunch. It was like ha, ha, and like killed himself, maybe. Yeah, he killed himself. Yeah. Um, you know what? I think I want to append my big scope ending with Corbin or whoever is the bright star will join with the giants to defeat. Yeah, Nathair. I think that's going to have to happen. Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's what's looking. It's looking like the giants and the humans are going to have to really settle some differences to. Yep. Figure. And I think that some of the giants will be team Azroth and some of them will be team Elyon, obviously. But um, I think the giants are going to hopefully play a really big role here. I want to see some more lizards for mm -hmm. sure. Um, the white worms are cool. The, Pretty the cool. big snakes and everything. Like there's just, there's a lot going on here. Um, I want to see if storm has more to do with this than we thought. Um, they seem pretty fated to be with each other. Um, so with Corbin and Storm, I mean. Uh, so I want to see if I hope that Storm isn't just a big dog. You know, right. that's basically what I'm hoping for. Um, that she but, can like go get more of the Wolven and like lead a Wolven army against. Maybe the, I don't know. Uh, maybe she's a lot sweet. more sentient and a lot smarter than Corbin thinks that she is. That would be really awesome. Um, but yeah, there's. I think. Uh, scope wise like towards the end of the series i think this will end up um you know probably being that azroth is defeated because everybody joined together like that seems totally. like yeah I, mean, I would love to be surprised maybe it's something way different that'd be cool uh but right. if that is the case then i'm here for it i want to read all these books um, qn rises as the black star <laughs> what <laughs> that'd be pretty awesome too uh, yeah, but that's going to do it for us today, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I know it was a little bit all over the place because Chad and I thought we could do one episode for a 650 page, very complicated, uh, high fantasy, high epic fantasy book. So thank you for bearing with us. The next episode will be a lot more thorough. Yes. Um, it will be, a, we will, we will take our time a little bit more with uh, fewer events. We like took that. you through a five star meal and a bite from each course and not the order of one, two, three, four, five. So, <laughs> right. But we do try to keep these episodes, you know, between like an hour and two hours long. And uh, we don't want to stretch over to like three or four hours because that's just a lot. No, of, I know uh, we're pushing it right now, too. <laughs> but yeah, uh, join us uh, very soon because Chad and I will definitely get through these books pretty quickly now that we've kind of marched through the first one. And uh, yep, keep reading and keep listening. Thank you so much again for being here and for listening to this episode. I uh, hope you all have an awesome rest of your day. And of course, happy reading. Bye, everybody.